like to give our special, excuse me, special thanks to Joe Stern. Pardon me. I'm having a terrible time with my eyes. <laughs> the editor of the editorial page of The Sun, who has been with each of these panels. And we welcome again Mr. Charles Cordry, the defense correspondent of The Sun, who also has been a member of the panel and who is known to you not only for his articles in The Sun, but also for regular service as a panelist on the Washington Week in Review. We also welcome back Mr. Stephen Broy, the diplomatic correspondent of The Sun, formerly editor of The Sun's opinion commentary page, and a longtime foreign correspondent with the Associated Press. As has always been the case, the entire world of foreign affairs defines the scope of the panel. But the issue of the times give us, in this particular period, the panel in its after Reykjavik and the Iran-Contra scandal a particularly viable subject for discussion. The panelists will present their opening remarks and then the floor will be open to questions to the panel. The evening will promptly end at 7 p.m. Allow me to again welcome the panel and turn the program over to Mr. Stern to start the issues. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here for the seventh straight year. These are Reagan years. We came in with Reagan, this council did and this panel did. And uh, maybe we'll go out with them. Uh, but, but it's been an interesting metamorphosis. In, in the first panel, we didn't quite know what this man was going to do. Uh, as we now come to this panel, we, we, we really are as much in the dark as to how his <laughs> foreign policy is going to develop. But he has, he, has, he has had a foreign policy, and we have tried to comment upon it through the years, and perhaps for another two years we'll be doing the same thing. Uh, but if there's one thing that we know about foreign affairs, it's that they're quite unpredictable. In preparation for tonight's meeting, I got a hold of the 10 major stories as selected by uh, the Associated Press and UPI uh, for 1986. And uh, it's an interesting list, and I will recite them in their order of preference. And I'd like you to note how many of them are foreign and how comparatively few are domestic. The Challenger explosion, we didn't talk about O-rings at our last meeting. The Chernobyl disaster, we had never heard of Chernobyl a year ago. Iran-Contra, we had not known that the president had signed off on a special paper permitting arms sales to Iran. Libya, we did not yet have the circumstances which led to the bombing of Libya. The Philippines, at this point, uh, a year ago, uh, it was a, a dream, more than, far more than a reality, that uh, uh, Mrs. Aquino would uh, topple the Marcos dictatorship. Then we have our first domestic issue, which is the income tax. Then there's U.S. versus Nicaragua. Way down near the end is the Reykjavik summit. Then comes the spread of AIDS, which is an international story. And finally, the, South, the continuing South African story. So you can see there are issues in that list that were not foreseen a year ago. There will be issues a year from now that we'll be discussing that we cannot foresee now. But we will be very much in the throes of a presidential campaign. To start our discussion, I'm going to turn this uh, panel over to uh, Charles Cordry who is our military correspondent. And uh, after that, Steve, will, uh, Steve Browning will talk about diplomatic uh, affairs. And then I'll close with a few remarks about the political outlook look, uh, and how it's affected by foreign affairs. And then we promise to open this forum to questions. 
uh, by 6.30 or uh, uh, 6.35. Thanks, Joe. Hello again. It's nice to see you folks once more. There is in Washington a musical group called the Capitol Steps, which is an awfully good outfit composed of uh, present and former members of staff, so members of Congress. And uh, they, they sing uh, political songs. Uh, for example, to the tune of the uh, uh, great My Fair Lady piece, The Rains in Spain Fall Mainly on the Plain, they sing, Immense Expense is Mainly in Defense. <laughs> and they have many others, but in, at any uh, event, my, my point tonight is, one of my points tonight is going to try to be uh, to say that arguably the Capitol Steps will have to rewrite their uh, song because uh, immense expense is not going to continue to be mainly in defense. Uh, the president sent his budget to Congress this week, as you know, and it calls for spending a trillion dollars in fiscal 1988. We'd never had a trillion dollar budget before, but it was inevitable that someday we would. And defense comes out at about a third, $297.6 billion of that. Actually, it's uh, uh, down slightly from the current year in, in its proportion of the total budget. It's about $5 billion more than Social Security and Medicare will, uh, will take in fiscal 1988. Dwell on this just a trifle because I think that one of the big issues in this year ahead, if we uh, can have two big issues in one year, and I sure, I'm sure you know the other one, yeah, one of the big issues is going to be the uh, allocation of money between defense and non-defense. There's been a great shift in this country over the past quarter of a century in this regard. In, um, in John Kennedy's time, we spent uh, about 8.7 percent of the gross national product on defense and 10 uh, percent on non-defense. But today, we're spending about 7% of the gross national product on defense and about 17% on non-defense. So there's been a great shift, uh, and it's worth keeping in mind when you hear that immense expense is mainly in defense. Uh, the issue in Congress, uh, as it talks about whether we need more taxes, and it will talk about that, uh, and uh, we'd better not predict what might happen, is going to be how much government we really do want. Uh, is the Reagan credo now out of date? Do we want bigger government than the president thought and uh, successfully convinced us we uh, wanted uh, or did not want uh, when he was first elected? Uh, certainly there's going to be a constituency for social and anti-deficit uh, activities and the, the constituency for defense is going to be correspondingly less. Well, just briefly, this uh, new defense budget uh, emphasizes Mr. Reagan's top priority from the beginning, and that is the modernization of our strategic nuclear forces. This is done at the expense, many will argue, of our conventional Army, Navy, and Air forces. And so one of the big issues will be whether to shift money from big nuclear weapons to the uh, needs of the uh, uh, land, sea, and air forces. Also, and in the same regard, he does ask for a huge increase in uh, percentage terms, 66%, for the Strategic Defense Initiative or the Star Wars program. Um, nonetheless, the budget is, is uh, much smaller than the President originally had expected, and the result is going to be a great stretch out for the purchases of all of the weapons that matter uh, that the forces buy. What this means is you're going to spend less for defense in fiscal 1988, but you're going to pay more for what you get. The uh, stretch out in programs means the unit prices will go up. Uh, so much for defense. I mean, I, I think that I don't see that there's been the reckoning that is inevitably coming, a new strategic assessment of what we might need. Uh, so far, for the coming year, just uh, slowdowns. But uh, one, other, one other aspect I'd like to touch on, because it has to do with the defense and foreign affairs both, and that is the little uh, 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 bizarre uh, activity in the National Security Council staff, about which I'm sure Steve will be glad to uh, tell you a great deal more. But this, uh, uh, this, the National Security Council was set up uh, to advise the President on foreign policy and to integrate the activities of all the government agencies that have to do with foreign military policy. Uh, it developed that they had one named Colonel North on the staff. Uh, who engaged in uh, either 
some outlandish activities of his own uh, uh, design or some that he was ordered to and the Congress hopes to find out which it is in the end and uh, we, don't, we, we don't know yet. Obviously, we don't know yet, but the result in the past year and looking down the road has been to uh, put Mr. Frank Carlucci in the White House to reorganize the National Security Council staff and to get it to do what it was originally supposed to do and has done for many other presidents since World War II. Uh, good evening. Um, looking back over the diplomatic events of the past year, I'm reminded of the story that may or may not be true, associated. it's associated with the Congress of Vienna in 1815 when the reordering, reordering of, of post-Napoleonic Europe was underway. And this interminable, very formal Byzantine Congress was underway for, 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 for a long time, and, and, and each day's session, it seems, was punctuated by a ball, some immense dinner, great gathering of the diplomatic personnel, princes and foreign ministers. And one evening, well into the Congress, the Spanish ambassador came urgently up to Prince Metternich, who was sort of the major domo of the whole thing, and he said, Sir, the Turkish ambassador has just died. And Metternich scratched his chin and said, I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> and regarding some of the recent decisions the actions and policy initiatives of President Reagan, one is also tempted to ask, what did he mean by that? Uh, most urgently to mind comes the Iran-Contra affair, where we were asked to believe that a lieutenant colonel in the Marines organized a vast conspiracy, covered mu much of the globe, involving large clandestine shipments to a country of arms, to Iran, a country which is officially declared as a terrorist state by the Secretary of State. The profits from this operation were then deviated through a number of complicated financial arrangements to purchase arms for the Nicaraguan rebels, the Contras in Central America, and that practically nobody outside of Colonel North and his titular boss, Admiral Poindexter, knew anything about it. In Washington, they're beginning a long, probably painful, and probably wounding series of investigations into this affair. The administration, which began the year with so much promise, so much of a sense of purpose, and foreign policy has ended it in apparent disarray. The Iran-Contra thing came on the heels of the Reykjavik debacle, where the president entered a, a complicated negotiation, ill-prepared, prob probably ill-advised. Symptomatic of some of the problems, in my view, is a, a statement that Donald Reagan, the White House Chief of Staff, made in an interview with the New York Times a few weeks ago, right after the Iran thing, news of the Iran sale, arms sales, uh, first made, made the front pages and the television networks. And Donald Reagan said, some of us are like a shovel brigade that follow a parade down Main Street cleaning up. We took Reykjavik and turned what was really a sour situation into something that turned out pretty well. Who was it that took this disinformation thing and managed to turn it? Who was it took on this loss in the Senate and pointed out a few facts and managed to pull that? I don't say we'll be able to do it four times in a row, but here we, here we go again, and we're trying. The interesting thing about that is that Donald Reagan, the Chief of Staff in the White House, the man who controls access of information and people to the President, seems to view foreign policy as a public relations exercise in the United States instead of foreign policy as the tool with which America's interests are protected and advanced abroad. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, political outlook. Uh, strangely enough, we're not thinking very much about that as we uh, watch the Iran-Contra drama go on. But 
14 months from now, we probably will have picked the next President of the United States. <laughs> and although it's a cliche to say that uh, Americans spend much too long a time choosing a president, the fact is that it's going to come at us fast and hard and massively at a, in a situation where there's very little attention being given to the views of potential candidates. In fact, most people don't have much of an idea what they stand for. So I think it might be a good occasion at this uh, tonight to, to look at what, what's ahead of it. First of all, we have a president who has had enormous clout in foreign policy and in the world for six years for one key reason, and that is that he had the very strong support of the American people. It was reiterated again and again, and he showed his effectiveness in, in <clears throat> pushing practically all of his policies <coughs> through Congress. In fact, the override of his veto on South Africa was mainly interesting in that it was an aberration from the pattern of the Reagan years. Foreign countries in dealing with the United States are very conscious of how strong or weak the president of the moment might be. So we've had this situation of six years of a very strong president, and suddenly the entire Washington establishment has turned on him almost with with a uh, desire, a pent-up desire to destroy, or at least to cut down to size, uh, a politician <coughs> that has very well mastered the, the intricacies of Washington politics. He came into Washington and he showed the old timers there how to do it. And if we look at his policies through the year, we might not agree with them, we, not, we might not even see much coherency in some of them, but the fact is that he was quite effective in pushing through what he considered in the national interest. I think the significance of the Iran-Contra affair is, will be played out in just how effective he will be, or are we going to just struggle along for two years uh, with an ineffective presidency and with a government that other governments will look at uh, with askance and perhaps with not too much respect. If we, if we look at that possibility as we go into this year and then consider what is about to confront us a year from now, uh, we, can, we can see that there will be a need for this country to start thinking about what kind of foreign policy the next president is going to have. Because as these stories that I listed at the beginning of this <coughs> meeting suggest, uh, voting might go by the pocketbook, but the interests of, of the human race are very much focused on uh, the hostilities and tensions uh, in the international field. Now, let's consider who is who might be running for the Democrats uh, a year from now when we have a massive Southern primary front-loaded, which very well could determine, determine who's going to be the President of the United States. A few of them can be defined somewhat. Sam Nunn can be defined as, as a Democrat of the center or right of center in the party very much dedicated to, to uh, a strong defense. Uh, uh, he, he has enormous appeal to the old line Truman Doctrine Democrats who lost power way back in 1972 and really have yet to recover and might never recover. But he also has domestic social positions that could harm him. And then there's a great doubt among some of my Georgian friends as to whether this country is ready to elect another Georgian. <coughs> uh, we, have, we have Gary Hart. He's a very interesting and thoughtful 
politician. He's associated with the Washington establishment. And though he had the good sense to depart from it uh, before going to the last election, he's a bit of a maverick in the party in that he resists the protectionism that he sees in the Democratic Party. Uh, he, he is also a bit of a, of a uh, isolationist of the Democratic liberalism associated with the in the 70s and 60s. So we, we do know a little bit about the politics of Sam Nunn and Gary Hart. We know, and also, of course, Ted Kennedy, if he come on the scene here. We know very little about some of the Democratic governors who very well might emerge as, as uh, candidates. Remember, uh, Jimmy Carter was hardly heard of a year before he was nominated. But we have people like Bruce Babbitt and Mario Cuomo and Dukakis and Blanchard. These are governors who, who are pragmatic people, who are not associated with the ideology of the party, who might very well be the party's choice if, if it cannot quite choose between uh, its liberal wing, uh, as epitomized by Teddy Kennedy, or its more conservative wing, as epitomized by, by uh, Sam Nunn. Uh, somehow, we're going to have to find out what such men think, of, think about this world and about how it's going to be conducted. And we don't know that. On the Republican side, the, the list right now is a fairly short one, although there always could be more to join. We, we do know pretty much what the foreign policy of Jack Kemp is, or Bob Dole, or Howard Baker, or George Bush. And what's interesting is that they might try to distance themselves from the president on many issues. But most of these issues are domestic, if you think about it a bit. Bob Dole's handling of this presidency has mainly been to divorce himself from the uh, supply-side economics, which has, have run up uh, in enormous deficits. Uh, in foreign policy, he generally takes a pretty hard line. Uh, Howard Baker uh, has yet to be heard from since he retired into the wilderness to run for president. He, of course, is the most moderate of the group. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see if, if a man representing the moderate group uh, could make any headway in a, in a party that, up till now at least, has been so dominated by Reagan. Uh, so far as George Bush is concerned, he's a vice president. We all know what happens to vice presidents. Uh, Kemp, Kemp is, has been trying to uh, take a very hard rally around the president position on the Iran-Contra affair, which has not done him any good at all in the polls. And I still believe that if Kemp is to surge ahead, as some political observers believe, it will be, have to be on domestic issues. Uh, he's kind of a populist right winger. And uh, uh, this will be his, his way of doing it. So uh, I would like to end this, these opening remarks by just urging you all to remember that 14 months from today, we'll be getting ready for Super Tuesday super, super, super Tuesday, and we're going to be picking the successor to uh, our present leader. Uh, we've always tried to open this panel to as much questioning as possible. My old boss, uh, Don Patterson, said 7 o'clock. Don't believe it. <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll go a little bit longer than that if there are any people who wish to uh, declaim or question us or, or whatever, but we're wide open for questions as we have been in the past. Yes, sir. Aside from all the obvious political reasons, is there any logical reason for multiple investigations by Congress of the Iran affair, each committee and subcommittee calling the same witnesses and looking for the same uh, written testimony? Uh, I'm, I've been asked to repeat the question, uh, each of the questions, and this gentleman asks, is there any logical reason why there should be two
two committees going over the same business on the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, Steve, do you want to take that? I'll, I'll be glad. What do you do, tell me to take it? Yeah. No, there's no logical reason for it. <laughs> Except that we have a House and we have a Senate, and neither one's going to let the other one get ahead. Yes, sir. Two short ones for you, Mr. Stern. One, I noticed you uh, seem to have forgotten. I think he was the very first announced, Pete Dupont. How come you passed him off? <laughs> and the second question? <laughs> <laughs> and the second question is, is what now, something around a month or after, uh, what's the present poll on the popularity of the president? Uh, we came out, the first one, as I recall, was supposed to have dropped, what, 22%, then we heard it had an adjusted value of 18 and so that leaves me in a quandary, and I'm betting that this president's popularity will go up and exceed what it ever was. Uh. <clears throat> There were two questions. One, why I failed to mention Pete DuPont. Uh, my answer to that is that was a flaw on my part because I never discount the uh, improbable in politics because it always seems to happen. Uh, uh, the other has to do with the popularity of the president. Once again, we're seeing a situation where uh, the president personally remains popular in the country among the same people who don't like his policies. But this is nothing new. This has been a constant throughout the Reagan presidency uh, that his personality clicks with the American people. He remains very high up in the polls. Uh, it's down a bit now, but he still has that residual liking among the people. And uh, they'll like him uh, as, as a, uh, a writer in New Republic uh, uh, suggested this week, even if they're convinced he's lying. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, most of these same polls uh, show a very definite feeling among the American people, justified or not, uh, that uh, they have not been getting uh, the true story from this present. I think an interesting aspect of this is to what extent in the conduct of foreign policy do the American people, uh, are the American people willing to uh, uh, tolerate a certain amount of duplicity? And uh, that's a question I think uh, we will have to just ask without ever answering. Yes, sir. I think the first point to be made is that we'd better be grateful that SDI uh, did cause the Reykjavik uh, meeting to come to no conclusions. SDI won its first victory. Uh, there's no real reason on earth to link the nuclear deterrent in Central Europe to SDI. And Mikhail Gorbachev said earlier last year that he was willing to separate the missiles in Europe issue from the other issues in arms control. When he got to Reykjavik, he tied them back up again. Uh, this was a part, I believe, of, of the Kremlin's political strategy. If the president bought the package, he had got rid of something that worries him very much, and that's SDI. If the president didn't buy the package, as he didn't, then Gorbachev could hold himself up as a fellow who was for arms control, and Reagan wasn't. Uh, and he got away with that to some extent. Uh, your question presupposes that SDI is an economic and technological monstrosity. And uh, I don't propose to defend it, but I propose to defend the proposition that we ought to find out uh, whether something of this sort is possible. And I think you will find that at this stage, the effort to kill SDI is gone. It's behind us. And the argument from now on annually will be how much money to put into it rather than to put any into it. And I have a notion that you would like to ask a follow-up question. <laughs> The follow-up question is why the Russians gave up uh, something that uh, 
is of not great importance. Well, no, no. You, you want to have a go at that, Steve? You were, to, you were at Reykjavik. I, I, I know, but I, Gorbachev did not confide in me. <laughs> um, I think the Russians knew they would not have to give up something. Yes. No, I, I, I think uh, one, one answer, possible answer, obvious answer to the question is that, yes, SDI is nonsense. It's never going to work as the president and his entourage originally, originally <coughs> described it. But the Soviets have a very well-founded sense of, of respect for American technological prowess. And I would guess that in the background, not very far in the background, is a suspicion that even though this may look loony on the scheme, on the, on, on the surface, or at least unfeasible, excuse me, on the surface that with our great base of, of technology and learning and energy, that we would be able to burst through somewhere that they would not be able to follow adequately, and at the very least would force them to commit resources, which they sorely need, one supposes, for normal economic development mm -hmm. over toward this kind of research. This is where the expense, where the crunch of, of the economic uh, choices and priorities bears on the Soviets. And less, more so there than on nuclear weapons, which are already in place, and I think probably not very expensive to maintain, relatively speaking. Yes, sir. Where a group of wise men or elders uh, advising the president, I, I'd like to take a whack at that. Uh, if I might, uh, the answer, the short answer I would say would be no. Uh, this political system invests enormous power in the president. It's, it's embodied in the Constitution, and the Constitution specifically grants the power to conduct foreign policy to the president of the United States. Uh, a president of the United States comes in uh, with a personal mandate and uh, often with a personal agenda and it's the essence of democracy that, uh, uh, that, that uh, this reflects the uh, mood and choice of the people at the time given the limited choices they might have. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the, a group of elders and wise men is going to work in our system. Uh, it takes a uh, far more authoritative system, such as you might have in Japan, uh, to, to affect something of this nature. I would, I would like to caution us, though, that, that there is quite a bit of continuity in American policy. Uh, our basic policy uh, towards the Soviet Union has been quite constant since 1947, uh, when George Kennan first enunciated the containment policy. And uh, with variations and gradations and modulations, uh, I think a long series of presidents has, uh, has, has held to that basic framework of our policy. Uh, where we have had changes is in uh, how the political parties and the political moods uh, uh, view some of the policies that grow out of this, such as whether this nation is going to be an active interventionist power or it's going to uh, be a, a more uh, uh, reclusive or uh, isolationist power. Uh, and these things uh, go up and down, but I, I really don't think that uh, if we had some of the liberals, liberal Democrats that I mentioned on my list elected, that suddenly SDI would be abandoned, as Mr. Cordry mentioned this, the fact that it's now fixed in place. We certainly would, no president is going to abandon basic U.S. security interests in Central America or in the Persian Gulf. So that there are constants that uh, uh, operate in the presidency uh, even though personalities certainly, certainly prevail. I think one of the interesting aspects of the present scandal is that so much of 
Carter's policy was adopted by the very president who denounced it. Uh, yes, sir. Do you see any special significance in the Soviets' apparent uh, relaxation of some of the restrictions on the dissidents, on Sakharov and Sharansky and Orlov and some others? And do you think that this may lead to any increase in the release of the Soviet Jews? The question is, is there any significance in uh, Mr. Gorbachev's apparent liberaliz liberalization in the release of dissidents, and could this affect the uh, future of, of Soviet Jews? Uh, uh, Mr. Browning, who served many years in Moscow, ought to take this question. There's a great deal of significance. Indeed, there is. The problem is, is trying to forecast how far this movement will go. There are built-in limitations in the Soviet system, one would suppose, about how much liberalization there can be, since it's based on the idea, the notion of, of a one-party state which has a monopoly of, of political wisdom and, of course, political power. The economic strictures, problems of the Soviet Union right now would seem to dictate a rationalization of the whole system. Um, it's quite extraordinary what's being said and some of the things that are being done. Uh, when I was there, Andrei Sakharov was an outcast. He was protected by, I suppose, his, uh, his colleagues in the Academy of Sciences and because of his reputation of having been a developer of the, uh, one of the developers of the Soviet H-bomb. But he was an outcast, and the idea of, of the general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party calling him up after he'd been in trouble, in exile in Gorky, for example, as Gorbachev did, personally calling him up the way Reagan would call somebody up at a halftime or at the end of a World Series game, <laughs> and say, Andrei Dmitrovich, you're allowed to come back to Moscow and resume your, resume your patriotic work in a normal life. This, to me, is extraordinary. I, I, had I had this, somebody told me in 19... 74, when I left Moscow, that something like this would happen in, in 1986, I would have said, you're crazy. Or something less polite, I don't know. But um, yes, of course, the, the, this is all very interesting, and it's laden, it's bursting with significance. How far the party bureaucracy, whose jobs, after all, are on the line. If the liberalization goes through, it means more efficiency, more openness, they have to perform better. They've, they're, they're in place now, most of them, not because of this, but because they work their way up the party ladder and please some party boss and behave themselves, et cetera, et cetera, not necessarily for efficiency. So if they, he can overcome the bureaucracy, which is an enormous if under that system, um, the possibilities are, are, are quite interesting and, 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 and quite extraordinary, yes. Um, but, and yes, uh, one would suppose, continuing the, the logic of this, that if one accepts the notion that a request to leave the Soviet Union is no longer a dishonorable or unpatriotic act, then yes, one, this would, one, would, one would suppose allow for a freer emigration of Soviet Jews who are now uh, prohibited from leaving. But it's just, right now, it's touch and go. Uh, Khrushchev, in a different way, tried to shake things up in the Soviet Union and ran afoul of the, uh, lost his power, basically, because he threatened the, uh, the positions of too many party bureaucrats, and if Gorbachev does that, and I'm sure he's very aware of, of the risks involved, then he could lose his position too. But it's quite extraordinary. I mean, just one, one small thing. In Reykjavik, I ran into a, a Soviet Russian I used to, I knew, was very good friends with in, in, in Moscow, who had been a, a dissident, and he and his family were subsequently allowed to leave. And he was there taking pictures. He's for a French photo photographic agency. And there were a couple people from the far official, Soviet officials from the foreign ministry up there speaking to the press the way I'd never heard Soviets speak to the international press before, and talking about democratization of the workplace. <laughs> and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And he says to me, you know, you remember, you know, we, we, we had friends who were sitting in the gulag in 1972 for proposing just such, just such a solution. I mean, so in a sense, yes, a, a great deal apparently has been, has been, a great deal of ground has apparently been covered. Whether this can continue on to some sort of logical rationalization, I don't know. But it's extremely interesting. It must be a marvelous time to be there. Uh, 
the United States and its, its principal allies in Europe seem to be drifting further apart economically. Uh, the Germans' uh, the mark is going up. There's talk of a, a, a realignment of the European monetary system. The president's playing hardball with high tariffs. Congress is talking about uh, protectionist legislation. Where do you see this going in the next year? Anyway. Joe. Well, where we'll go in Congress is, is in, I'm sorry, the, the question is, uh, we, we have increasing trade tensions with uh, West, Western Europe. Where is this going to go in the coming year? Well, where it's going to go is right up to Capitol Hill, uh, where, where the uh, Democratic uh, majority in both houses has targeted uh, trade legislation as uh, as an opportunity uh, to uh, s set forth uh, a party position quite clearly defined. Uh, this is particularly true of speak of the Speaker of the House, who was very instrumental in putting together uh, last year's uh, uh, trade bill, a trade bill that the President uh, described as the Kamikaze Trade Bill. Uh, which was uh, quite protectionist in, in many of uh, the punitive features it mentioned. I suspect that uh, Speaker uh, Jim Wright will be back on the war path uh, uh, with a trade bill, and I fully expect that the, the Senate will pass one t a trade bill too. It might modify the House bill somewhat, but I think before the year is out, you're going to have a, a, a confrontation between the Democratic Congress and uh, the Republican president. Uh, uh, some of the things that Reagan is doing right now, in my view, are, are, are part of an attempt to uh, uh, assuage Congress, to appeal, to, to get some support for his policies by appearing a lot tougher and getting away from his purest uh, free trade rhetoric that uh, he has indulged in. Uh, whether, whether this can avoid uh, a big fight, I doubt it. I, I think that any time the United States is running trade deficits of $170 billion, uh, uh, this country is going to be taking some actions uh, that will be annoying partners who are quite willing to let us continue running such deficits. Way back there, yes. Well, with the increasing protectionist policy and the, the international embarrassment for the IRA conflict here, what adverse effect, if any, on individual Americans abroad is there? Or will there continue to be? Uh, the question is, is with increased protectionism, uh, uh, what uh, what effect this would have on, on Americans abroad? Excuse me, do you mean Americans working abroad or Americans traveling abroad? Both. <laughs> traveling abroad, I was thinking very little. Um, working abroad, if they're paid in dollars, it's probably going to make things more expensive for them. That's not much of an answer. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, that's what the talk to the uh, council last year, and I believe he was one who was being considered to be the ambassador in South Africa. And it was reported that he uh, uh, didn't want to take up that position because there was no coherent United States policy towards South Africa. Is there a policy, or is it still in the in a state of flux? Uh, the, the questioner mentioned that Ambassador Todman addressed this group last year, and he had been mentioned as, as a potential uh, ambassador to South Africa and uh, uh, as a potential black American being assigned to that position, I might add. Uh, he turned it down and someone else took it. The, the question is, uh, is there any coherent policy uh, towards South Africa? Uh, I think Steve can handle that. The policymakers and State Department would probably answer you by saying, yes, the policy is coherent. 
but it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's coherent in the sense that if you, if you accept the, the assumptions that the administration is operating on, then the policy ought to work. But I think the problem arises when you examine the assumptions and that in addition to being very difficult and tractable, they're not the ones, it seems, that the authors of the policy had begun with. That's, a, does, does that an adequate answer? I believe uh, Mr. Schultz is going to have a meeting with the ANC. Yes, he is. Indeed, he is. Uh, I mean, does the ever change? Uh, there, there, there's, here again, I mean, this, in the administration's foreign policy, as near as I can tell, um, at states, you've got, by and large, uh, a consensus on most things. Um, I think there are probably some dissenters over constructive engagement, but by and large, people go along with it. Um, as part of constructive engagement, the State Department in recent months, I think not in years, recent months, has recognized the value of trying to deal with the African National Congress as a legitimate political, as what would be a legitimate political force. The tension arises there, not so much within the State Department, but between the State Department and some senior members of White House staff, for example, who feel that the African National Congress, who, who say probably rightly, and that some senior members in the African, African National Congress, Congress are are communists or are sympathetic to the, to the communist cause, therefore they should not be dealt with. The State Department, Africa specialists say the African National Conference is a f Congress is a force that must be dealt with and we must encourage uh, the, more, the more moderate and reasonable people within the ANC, therefore we are going to see, I believe, a meeting for the first time between the American Secretary of State and a senior member of the Afri African National Congress, either in Washington or in, or in Africa, I'm not sure where. But yes, this is a change. This is a, this is a change in, it probably not, would not have been possible two years ago. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stern, I gave you a book last year called Hitler's Secret Bangers. Did you get an opportunity to read it? Did you find it interesting? It makes no difference. I thought in that meeting, and how the Hebrew scholar said that it was basically true. Uh, the so my question to Mr. <laughs> Cordrez is, it was reported by a Dutch seaman about a large shipment of arms from this country going to the Middle East. Could that be the 50 helicopters that wound up in North Korea that were American made? Uh, the question is uh, uh, whether a report of a large shipment of American arms to the Middle East might have included helicopters that wound up in North Korea. I must confess that you've got me with my lower vestments loose from their <laughs> moorings, as H.L. Mencken would have said. I don't know anything about this one. Do you know anything about this one, Steve? No. Uh, you, you, I, I just don't know it. <laughs> yes, sir. To follow up on an economic question with regards to Europe, and this is also from Mr. Cordry, do you think that there is a possibility that Reagan, although Mr. Stern thinks he's posturing for a Democratic Congress, do you think Reagan might, in terms of trying to reduce the deficit, might indicate and get tough with Japan and require Japan to rearm itself and begin protecting itself by the beginning of the 21st century? The, the question is, is whether uh, uh, the president's going to get tough with Japan and require it to uh, rearm itself uh, for, I guess, uh, larger military duties at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, no, I think not. Uh, the Japanese have now decided that they would put more than 1% of their gross national product into defense, which has been a sort of a political dividing line that they didn't want to cross. I think it means really very little that they have crossed it. I forget how much 1% of their GNP is, but it's not peanuts. Um, but the, uh, the, the idea, the, the question you're really asking is, 
is the United States, I think it is, is the United States going to permit Japan to continue to shelter under the nuclear umbrella and do very little for its own defense? You got it. All right. Now, another way of asking that is the United States going to dictate to Japan that the Constitution, which the uh, United States dictated to Japan, shall be abrogated. Uh, I mean, the, the Japanese uh, have got a Constitution, which uh, was uh, largely American produced, which puts pretty considerable limits on what they can do militarily. Uh, they've also got a thing about certain warlike activities, and we ought not to be entirely sorry about that. Uh, so I really think that what you see, what I see anyway, is a constant pressure on the Japanese to spend more money on defense, to take on a little more of the burden year after year, and this they do, defend the sea lanes and the air lanes out to a thousand miles. Uh, but, um, but do I see the Japanese building a fleet that could escort the 80 or whatever percent of the oil that they import goes across the Indian Ocean? No, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't. Do you? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, after the trade agreement that was reached in Canada last week, uh, which may also have been a slow signal, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I would like to just add one cynical comment to all that. and. and that is, I think that uh, as we Americans have begged the Japanese to uh, uh, increase their defense efforts in very, very microscopic increments over the years, uh, we have done so while making trade concessions to get this that we shouldn't have been making. Uh, I think that it's been a uh, ploy that has very much uh, uh, been in the Japanese interest rather than the American interest. I agree with that, and I'm going to add a PS. And, and that is that any government, I think, any government of Japan that would yield to our entreaties to up its defenses, say, to 2% of GNP, would not be in power very long, and you might get a government that would put it back down to half a percent of the GNP. <laughs> is, is there a chance for a Middle East solution if Syria's misfortunes uh, continue? One of the greatest sources of pessimism in the world for people involved in diplomacy is the Middle East. If the Syrian problem were to disappear to the satisfaction of the United States and its allies, this is not to say that something else equally pernicious would not surface. Uh, the last thing, again, going back to diplomatists' love for stability, the last thing they would want <laughs> would be a sudden collapse of Egypt, which would create a vacuum after all. This is, this is the Soviet Union's principal client, you know, this, the state on which it has its main stake in the Middle East, and for this to suddenly disappear would create instabilities I don't think either of us would want to deal with. So all I can do is convey a sense of uh, a great pessimism, which I get from people who deal with this on a professional basis in the State Department and the White House. 
Go ahead. Well, if we're about to wind up, I want to come back to the original question. Uh, my answer to it was so popular that I let it lie. And that was whether there should be, was any sense in multiple investigations of the Iran-Contra scandal. And when I said it, there was no logical reason, everybody was seemed pleased. Uh, but uh, let, let me just uh, answer that uh, uh, again, if I might. The House of Representatives and the Senate have responsibility for foreign affairs and for legislation, and each house does its own investigation of everything that um, it has anything to do with. And so it's not, it may not be logical that they should do it, but it's not illogical either. And then, of course, the, in the more extreme situation, which I must call your attention to, it's the house's job to conduct uh, investigations that could lead to impeachment proceedings, and it's the Senate's job to do the trying. So there are, there are, after all, logical reasons that we have multiple inquiries into the Iran affair. Uh, but um, I suppose you'd be entitled to ask the next question, which would be, do these reasons have anything to do with why two committees want to pounce on this issue? Thank you, John. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> As you can see, Mr. Stern was quite wise in suggesting, if you look at your watches, that he would continue until 7.15 or later. Standing at the back of the room, as I have been for the last 45 minutes, I was particularly impressed not only with the variety of the questions, the attention of this rather large audience, but the very significant questions which were posed. I have about 50 more that I would like to throw at the panel but I don't think that would be fair to you or to them. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to extend our most sincere thanks to Mr. Stern, Mr. Forger, and Mr. Brown. And last but not least, thank you for coming.